I'm originally from Frankfort, Kentucky, and I was born in Ashland, Kentucky, uh, but I ended up moving to Frankfort with my mom when uh, she was divorced from my father, so I grew up in Frankfort. My mom worked for the state, and uh, my father, uh, who my mom was divorced from and I didn't spend too much time with, was, uh, was an insurance salesman. And my mom still works for the state to this day, and they both live in Frankfurt. And my mom has since remarried, and they both work for the state and uh, live in Frankfurt. High school was erratic for me. I had friends in so many different circles, some going to college, some going to college on scholarships, athletic scholarships, some not going to college at all. And I think I fell right there in the middle between that where I had the ability and the intellect to go to college, but I was mature enough to know that I was too immature to do successful and to be successful in college. So I think I made a decision after I graduated. It, it didn't dawn on me until I had already graduated that, that I needed to do something with more importance uh, and something that will put me in the right path to being successful. Because I knew at, at any given time that I wanted to get my education. I just didn't know how I was going to do it at 18. I didn't have a college fund. I didn't have an athletic scholarship. Um, as far as academics after high school go, went for me, I was accepted to some of the predominant state schools here in the state of Kentucky, but I knew upon acceptance that I was neither mature or ready to go to college. I took the summer and I trained with the recruiter and from there I went to boot camp. I received a phone call one summer right after high school graduation and it was Sergeant Dustin Barnes uh, from the recruiter's office in Frankfurt. And he wasn't pushy, he wasn't overbearing. He just called and said, hey, what's up? I said, not much. And it was probably during the time of the summer where I was not doing much, probably sitting around playing Xbox or something really insignificant. And he said, you want to do something cool? You want to do something that means something? And I said, well, teach me about it. Teach me and help me learn exactly what it is that you do as a Marine. Because up until then, I'd had some military figures in my life, but no Marines. I knew that they were an elite group of, of men and women, but I, I didn't know what it took to be a Marine. I didn't know what the typical Marine was like. So I spent a summer with him uh, training. Uh, we would go running five days a week. He would teach me about the day in the life. He would tell me what my MOS was going to be like. He would tell me what his MOS was going to be like. He would tell me what it was like to be eight years in. And I picked his brain and really as an 18-year-old made a really informed decision looking back on it. You know, before then I would have just jumped right into something. But I knew this was going to be something really, really, really serious. And it was going to affect my family's life, my life. And so... I, I spent a good time contemplating before I actually stepped in and signed the papers up in Louisville. In grade school and for a few summers, I would go to Millersburg Military Institute and I would spend what was two summers there. and. That's where I got my first taste of the military lifestyle. Even though I was 14, 15 years old, 
I was living in barracks. I was being supervised and trained by Army, former Army sergeants and NCOs. Uh, so they instilled this kind of regimented attitude in me at a, at, at a young age. And when I left the first summer uh, after being at Millersburg, I walked away from that wanting to go to West Point, wanting, wanting to go to VMI. And that was kind of the, I guess you would say, the, the, the big militaristic, military influence that I had when I was younger. Um, it didn't really, it didn't really come to realization until I was done with school and I was looking at all my friends who had, you know, plans to go to college and just kind of had this carefree attitude that they were going to go to college and go to class and uh, graduate in three to four years or seven years. And, you know, I turned to my parents and I said, you know, what's it look like? And they said, well, probably have to take some loans out, you know, probably have to, you know, make ends meet, but we, we don't, monetarily, we can't support you all the way through college. So I had to make a, a, a quick decision. And I think I fell back on my experiences at Millersburg. And so I don't think there was a certain point. I'm not going to say that it was always my dream, that it was something that I stayed up at night thinking about and I worked towards. But I think it was absolutely a a decision that I made over the course of seven, eight years. I just didn't really know it. You know, as a, as a young 18-year-old that, you know, whose worldview didn't leave his front porch, this was something that I salivated at. You know, I wanted to get out of Frankfurt. I wanted to go see the world. I wanted to, you know, travel and see things and, and meet people. And, and, and of course, of course, when my mom was asking me those 20 questions. Of course, I'm going to talk about, yeah, but I get to do this. I get to do that. And it's, it's, it's going to be something I've never experienced, mom. And, and I think, I think they, they thought that I was a little naive and, and not sure what I was getting myself into. But I think when I came back from boot camp and, and, I had this air of confidence and this this direction, and every time I would come back from, you know, the fleet or deployment, and I still had that direction, and I still, you know, talked highly of the Marine Corps. I never, during my whole time in, talked bad about the Marine Corps. It's given me, it, it, it gave me and provided for me so much. I think I was an autopilot for boot camp. I was an autopilot. I didn't, there was, and this is true with the Marine Corps, this is probably more than likely true with every branch of the service. The schedules that the military and boot camp put you on, you don't have time to reflect. You're on to the next thing. You don't have time to think, oh man, I miss home, or oh man, that was, oh, that was hard. Man, I'm sore. Up, oh, on to the next thing. And then, so there's no downtime to even reflect on the events that happen. That's why that's why it's tough getting out of the military because there is time to reflect. So I did a lot of training missions uh, up until I went to Afghanistan and and uh, it took three years in until I got the call to go. Our unit, my, my liaison unit was, and our artillery battery or uh, battalion was unique in the sense that any, any company could have been picked to go with the grunt battalions with 1323 three, three, or 33. And it just so happened that Charlie Company, and I was in headquarters in an alpha. Charlie Company got picked to go support 1-3 over in Fallujah. Not our company. And there were more seasoned Ford observers 
to go over there than from liaison than than the rest of the guys in our unit. So we just kept missing missing the boat to go over, and so we trained and we were stationed in Hawaii. And I I thought that. I thought for the longest time that I was going to get out without serving overseas and, you know, as everybody else would say, dodging the bullet, dodging the deployment. And I worked really, really hard at my job. I tried to be the resident expert in anything that I would try to do. And and I, I, I kind of had a name for myself. So, you know, the reason that when I asked to go to Charlie Company, you know, to go overseas, they were like, you're too much of an asset right here. And you get mixed feelings when you hear that because it's like, well, can I, can I be a, an asset overseas, you know, fighting the enemy or, you know, supporting the war? And instead of doing, like, training or monotonous tasks, in garrison and so that that it wasn't anything that I dodged myself it's just something that I just kept kept missing me and um, and I remember I was home on leave and we had just gotten back from Okinawa on a pump on a, on a six-month tour over in Okinawa and My buddy called me and I was in the basement of my parents' house in Frankfurt doing laundry. And I got a phone call from my buddy Lao Chan. And um, <laughs> he said, he said, what's up? I said, not much, man. He's like, well, we just got out of formation and you, me, and Lar all got picked to go to Afghanistan with one three, Charlie Company. I said, I said, awesome. What? Seriously? And he's like, yeah, yeah. They they needed they needed three guys from liaison, and and we were handpicked to be part of a, a fire support team. I thought about there was this there, these rush of 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 happenings went through my head. Afghanistan. I get to go to the show. I'm, I get to go put all of this, this training, this this hard work, to good, you know, to use. And I immediately thought about how my mom. And my, my family, they always have these reflecting moments in the living room or in the kitchen and say, I'm just so glad you're not in Iraq or Afghanistan. That's what I thought about. I was like, well, I got something to tell them now. And at that moment, I hung up the phone and I think I finished folding a shirt and I kind of put my hands on the like on the, the, the washer, and I was like, and I thought about those things. I thought about, all right, these are, these, this is good. This is a good thing. I get to, get to go finally serve my country on the front lines, not only at a duty station or in a uniform or on a ship or in a barracks. I, I, I get to go carry, a, carry my weight. They have very archaic ways of communicating in Afghanistan, and a lot of the times they would take up Morse code or just use very simple code by flashing lights to communicate with others, you know, other sides of the mountain, you know, just like I'm here. When our unit, when a convoy would go through a, a, a village, it would be almost like a presidential motorcade. That's how the people would come out and just watch you as you drive by. Military age males. Uh, uh, young females, uh, older females, in, in burkas, um, which which was 
it was interesting because there would be times where we would just be on foot and we patrol through the village and some villages were you got a warm welcome some villages you got little kids coming up to you and pulling on your shoestrings or pulling on your your candy pocket or and it was more of a playful adolescent encounter but other times we would go through villages and there would be military age males that would stare at you those were the ones that looked at Americans as a negative for their country um, because they haven't seen they didn't experience the Soviet war they didn't experience the things that their parents did so they had this they had to make up their op opinion of of our occupancy in their own way and they absolutely communicate it with their eye contact and their body language and you as a Marine would always be on guard when, when you would come across men of that, you know, age group. I was out on a mission in the southern part of our province and um, another part of our unit was up in the northern part of the province that was over by the Pesh River Valley and there was this, uh, there was this one stretch of road called IED Alley, and uh, or IED Cliff, and it's this bend in the road that it's really easy to not be seen when you're digging through there. Um, no matter, since there's so much construction on this part of the road, there's no way to ever tell if it's been cut up or it's been dug into. So there's no way to tell if there's a raise in the earth or if there's fresh dirt on it. So there's no way to tell if there's, there was an ID planted right there. And a convoy was going through there and an ID went off and Lance Corporal Brixey immediately uh, was taken back to our base. Both of his legs were amputated and he was taken to Germany and he died a day later. And that, that word came back to our unit and it was my first time ever being on a base where, or in, in a unit where somebody had, had died due to combat reasons and the base goes River City and I didn't know what River City meant and I was like what's what's River City he's like all communications cut off you can't call out you can't get on the internet you can't you can't do anything my roommate was really good friends with him and it and he had shared stories about him and and but you I didn't really digest it too much I was like, you know, he's a Marine, he died. It was really tough. But I got a mission tomorrow. I got to pack my bag and go back out. But uh, then again, it's, it's completely recycled that apprehension that I have about being on the roads. The whole time you're sitting in this truck, you're thinking, I'm going to blow up, 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 I'm going to blow up. And you don't know when it's going to happen. You have ECCMs, you have these electronic countermeasures and electronic counter countermeasures. You have these, these devices that are in your trucks that are supposed to shield you from the signals that are sent to these IEDs, but Lance Corporal Brixey, Brixey and that first sergeant both had ECMs on their trucks. And somehow the IED was triggered through these electronic countermeasures that are installed on the trucks. They still 
were hit by an IED. So even that didn't give you a peace of mind. Even your chest plate and your your body armor that you wear, because when you're operating out in the hills, you don't you don't wear your throat protector, you don't wear your arm guard, you don't wear your your uh, crotch protector that goes to your thighs. But when you're in a truck, you you suit up because those things could potentially save your life or save a limb. And we didn't have AC. You didn't roll the window down because if a if a blast from the side of a hill went off, you would get peppered. And the worst was being in a truck that was that was that didn't have three three inch glass and wasn't up armored. The worst would be when you're exposed in the back of a uh, just the back of a truck with just nothing but like steel to hold you. And they designed them perfectly so your head stuck right over the edge of it. So the IEDs were were a huge point of stress for me every time I got on the roads. We had a, about a, a 25 day mission where we were uh, providing overwatch for a, a, a platoon that was going into this every day going into this village and uh, and capturing some high value targets and um, and every night before I would go to bed I would have these the, the Taliban were never known for probing your lines they were never they were never really known for probing your lines but there were a few instances up on our OPs at our base where they would go out in the morning and they would look at their claymores and they would be facing towards them knowing that somebody's out there doing something and you have no clue and they're doing it in such a way that I don't know like I said when it when it got when it got dark at night and I would pull out my sleeping bag and sleep on the side of the hill I didn't have anything but a, a rock on the other side of me and um, Even though I had a line of Marines that were keeping the line, keeping a 24-hour watch, the thought of them probing our lines always kind of, you know, rushed into my head. So, out in the field, I didn't sleep so well. Back on base, back on base, I slept more than I've ever slept in my whole entire life. I would take 30 days out in the field, two or three days off, and for those two or three days, I would sleep constantly. I would only wake up to eat and shower. And I would have this, before I went, I would have this reoccurring dream. This, and this dream that I would anticipate combat, and I had never been to combat. It was this dream that I was sleeping in this, I had made myself this body-shaped hole in the ground. And I'd slept in it, you know, to kind of keep the heat in and I'd put my mat down in it and put my sleeping bag and I was sleeping in it. And it was, and there was this rock, there was this rock about the size of my, the length of my body that was and about, you know, six inches high that was keeping me protected, you know, and uh, I would sleep behind that. This was before I'd even gone to Afghanistan. And, and I would have this reoccurring dream where I would, I would rack out and I would go to bed and I would wake up to these, these muzzle flashes in the distance and I would see the top of this rock just chipping. And, you know, just sound like something out of a movie, the pings. And, and then I would wake up 
this was in a barracks in Hawaii that I would have these dreams. And, and as I went to Afghanistan and got on this hill and was on this mission for about 25 days, sure enough, I got, the rock was bigger, but I dug myself a small little trench, laid my bag in it, went down it, went to sleep at night, and before every night before the sun would go down, and the sun would be in our faces, they would they would hit us. The Taliban would fire upon us. It was it was simply and solely because we couldn't see them because the sun was in our eyes. And I found cover behind this rock. When I got out, I had planned for months. I had learned about this program that the United States Postal Service was doing in Louisville, where they would pay you to work third shift and then pay for 100% of your classes and 100% of your books. And I knew I was getting the MGI bill, so I took that job, third shift. And I worked in operations planning, basically a bean counter, data input. And um, I would go to work at, and mind you, I, I, I didn't grow up in Louisville. I grew up in Frankfurt, so I didn't know anybody in Louisville. I just moved there because of the opportunity. And, um, and I, I, I think I wanted to be away from, from the mainstream. I wanted to kind of transition and adjust myself. So my schedule became, I would go to work at 10 o'clock at night till three o'clock in the morning. And then I would go home and sleep from three until eight. And I would go from class from eight until five o'clock in the afternoon. And then I would sleep from five to 10. And I did that for a year. And that was harder than the Marine Corps. There were some classes that I had taken that it, it required me to be engaged with the other students, but I always played it off. I always was like, tried to find ways to not talk about me being in the military. I didn't want any opinions being falsely put on me. Or I didn't want somebody talking about me while I was leaving class or even in class. So I, I kind of kept this, my experiences to myself. I mean, there would be times where somebody would ask me, why are you 24 and just you know, in school or, you know, just general conversation. And I would tell them, you know, I was in, I was in the Marines. 100% of the time, or probably nine tenths of the time, the veteran is more uncomfortable than the civilian because they don't know what to say. They don't know how to word things because we have a whole different terminology and, and an aspect on things. I avoided it because I didn't want to see myself put in a situation that I didn't know how to, knew how to get out of. Because I have a certain rhetoric with my Marine buddies and I can talk about things and the way I talk about them. And it's harder for me to communicate those experiences or ideas or ideologies or feelings to somebody that does it. I want to finish my graduate work and I've had a really good experience and humbling experience helping veterans and, um, and improving upon services at the University of Kentucky. And it, it's a humbling feeling to know that you're making a, a change 
in a large institution that so many people co go in and out of, students and employees and faculty, that don't bat an eye at some of the issues, that don't bat an eye at some of the things that are wrong, that they just come in and out and say that's just the way it is. It's a bureaucracy. And I, I tend to have a, uh, when I think about a problem, I don't think about how bad it is. I think about how to fix it. And I'm always thinking about the next step. I'm always thinking about, I look at a situation and, and see what's wrong with it and how I can fix it in a diplomatic way uh, and in a responsible way. And I've, I've felt that I've been pretty successful at that with the student organization and the issues that it's brought up at the University of Kentucky. And whether it's in a capacity that I'm dealing with veterans or not, I want to contribute towards UK because it's, it's, it's a school that, and an environment that I've really became fond of. And one day I'd like to teach in the evenings and be an administrator by day uh, at UK. And what's really, really, really motivating about this this decade, this, these past five years, is that there's some really, really passionate people that are involved with veterans' issues. There's some really passionate veterans that want to help other veterans, and they need to have that mentality when getting out of active duty. Soldiers helping soldiers, Marines helping Marines. They need to get away from that stigma that you're getting out, you're a bad person. No, you served your country. Let me prepare you to do even greater things. And that, that is lost. That is just completely awash in the military because as soon as you make the decision to get out, you're ousted. You're not necessarily ousted, but you're, you become useless. To the military? To the military, to the unit, to the, to the mission. And, and that's something that needs to be addressed, I think, in the big Army, in the big Marine Corps, in the big Navy. Because the transition out won't be that you let your unit down or that you're, you still feel like a rigid Marine or a rigid soldier. And, uh, and so that transition into the classroom won't be so harsh. They don't, you can't, you can't teach or you can't water down a Marines or a soldiers or a sailors or a Coast Guard Marines or a person experience. You can't water down those experiences. You can't water down a person's experiences to make it easier on them in the, in the civilian world. But to prepare them for what it's going to be like and to be more cautious in those classes is something that just, it's just something that needs to be stepped up in the military because those, those transition classes, those taps that they send you to by mandatory have just become a check in the box and they haven't done anything useful because you're, you and I or another veteran out there can attest to that, that we all had a hard transition. And maybe it would have been better if there would have been some passionate people in these programs, but there's not. There's, they usually throw the lowest common denominator in these programs and they just, they just teach the stuff just to get to the end of the day. And they don't really engage these Marines and they don't engage these soldiers to to really get ready for what's about to hit them, which is you need a job. Are you going to get an education? Oh, well, you can use this, 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 and that. And it's sad that so many of these nonprofits and so many of these special interest groups have had to be so involved with veterans transition outside of the military that the military doesn't work harder on trying to, to fix it before they get out. So I think one thing that's so great about 
the nation right now is how the nation has wrapped their arms around veterans' issues. And a project like this that with no agenda just wants to hear a story like mine and to be able to sit here behind a camera and talk about this is is insanely humbling to be able to share my story at such a young age that's worthy of being put on a website or worthy of being put on on film is is humbling and if I could get a message out there to say that that the military just needs to be more aware of what they're putting out into the civilian world. They need to be more cautious and more passionate about prepping them for that transition.